Good morning. Uh, welcome to worship this morning. Uh, we are live streaming again, so welcome to anybody watching from anywhere in the world. Uh, it's great to uh, welcome you here to First Grantham United Church. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we had a great concert here, a big band concert, so our stage is still here. And uh, with one thing that didn't get put away, so that'll be removed uh, later on uh, this week. Um, the other announcement, uh, as I said, is that we're, we're live streaming, and um, it says in the bulletin that there is mail, and you've been really good coming back looking for your envelope, uh, except that there isn't mail this week. Uh, so um, it was an updated, uh, there were updated receipts, but there'll be other mailings going out shortly, so we decided to save the postage and do it a little bit later. So sorry for the confusion, but uh, there is no mail this week. Uh, Candace has a, a quick announcement. Good morning. I was just telling the choir that I've missed saying good morning to them on Sundays. Um, I, I'd like to make an announcement, uh, one of appreciation and also one of request. Over the past year, aided with the indispensable assistance and efforts of Lori Thwaites, First Grantham has enjoyed a new approach to greeting and offering collecting volunteer service. What Lori and I did was create a schedule recruited teams of volunteers to fill in the schedules, and every Sunday, no fail, there are five greeters. And it's amazing, and it works so wonderfully. And over the next couple of months, we'll be contacting those on the teams to see if you'd like to serve again. Please consider that opportunity. We'd love to have you join us for another year. The program has worked so well, in fact, that we're going to be rolling it out into another area, service in the nursery. I originally started with a list of 22 people who either have children or grandchildren who visit with the nursery or who have just joined into Sunday school. I also contacted uh, some people who really enjoy working with children. To run the program, we need to have 16 core volunteers. Out of the 22, I've not heard back from everyone yet, but I have had a couple of no's due to family responsibilities and other things in uh, those people's lives. So if someone in the congregation today is interested in serving in the nursery, you'd be, uh, as one of the core volunteers, you'd serve once every two months. That's it. And you'd get your dates in advance, and you'd have backups in case you're unable to serve, and I'd be there to support the whole way through. If you're interested, I'd love to hear from you, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Uh, I think those are all the announcements that I need to make verbally. Have I forgotten anyone? No? Well, please read your update. Uh, everything in there is important, and it'll keep you up to date on what's happening in, uh, in our congregation. Uh, let's take a minute now before we continue with worship to do what we do each week. We acknowledge that we are one in Christ by uh, greeting each other and sharing a word of peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Take a moment to stand, welcome those around you, make sure you share names and uh, share a word of peace.
The most common word for the church in the New Testament is not a fancy theological word. In fact, it's an extremely ordinary and everyday word. That word in the Greek language is ekklesia, from which we get fancy theological words like ecclesiastical. But the word ekklesia simply means gathering. That's what the church is. It's a gathering. The church is simply the gathering together <clears throat> of people who know Jesus and want to know him more, who try to follow Jesus and want to get better at it, who love Jesus and wish that that love was more evident in their lives. There's nothing especially mystical or mysterious about what we're doing here today. We are simply gathering. What is mysterious is what God can and will do with us if we don't stand in God's way. So having gathered, let us open ourselves to the presence of God and to the working of the Holy Spirit. People of God, let us worship the Lord. Our opening hymn today is number 218. If you want to use Voices United, the words will be projected on the screen. We praise you, O God. O oh God, you call us to be your light in the darkness, your voice in the wilderness, your hope for the hopeless. You give us strength in our weakness, peace and gentleness, words and boldness, to proclaim more of you and of us less. Form us as a potter fashions clay. Breathe into us the breath of Jesus' resurrection life, that we may honor and serve you all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, and I'll invite the children to come to the front. I think today we'll uh, maybe get you to sit here, just because the platform's kind of in the way. Actually, while the kids are coming up, I didn't, uh, I didn't mention that there will be coffee uh, in the Ruby Carroll Hall following the service, if you'd like to join us for conversation down here to my left in the hall. Hope you can stay. So I'll sit here and you can sit there. Um, anybody know what this is? It's a GPS. And what do you do with a GPS? You put it on your car and it tells you where to go. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and if you're, ma if you're if you're married to someone like me, like I am, who cannot find her way anywhere, a GPS is a great thing. GPS is a wonderful thing. Uh, anybody know what this is? What's this? 
Ashley? Yeah, it's a, it's a road map. So it's kind of like, does the same thing as a GPS. It's just that you have to open it up and you have to, you have to read it and it will tell you, uh, it will show you where, uh, how to get where you want to go. So if you want to go to Toronto or somewhere, you, you know, you open the map up and it'll tell you how to get where you want to go. And, and then what is this? It's the Bible, yeah. Well, these three things all have something in common. They all are guides. They all show us uh, how to get somewhere. Um, there's a difference between them, though, and that is that this one is really simple. You turn it on, you punch in where you want to go, and this nice voice uh, in a variety of different world accents tells you, uh, you know, it says, in 350 meters, turn right. And then it says, in 150 meters, turn right. Turn right. And I always want to say, I know. Stop it. <laughs> I don't need someone else telling me what to do. Anyway, the, uh, <coughs> the GPS will give you instructions. So it's really super simple. If you're driving um, and you're going to use one of this, these, you need help, right? You need somebody sitting beside you to say, oh, I think think we were supposed to turn back there okay and so you need some help this we need lots of help we it, it's really difficult to find your way if you're all by yourself with this guide with the Bible what we need is we need each other we need lots of people around us we maybe need our parents uh, we maybe need our kids church leaders, uh, our minister, uh, our friends. We need to get together and talk about it. Um, GPS, you can use all by yourself. Map, you usually need one other person. This one, we need a whole community. We need each other. And so that's one of the reasons we come here on Sunday morning, so that we can all uh, look in this guide, and it can show us where to go, not just to get to Toronto or wherever you happen to be traveling, but to get where we want to go in our lives. Okay? Well, we're going to sing together, and we've got a song that comes from Africa which, that we've done before called You Are Holy, You Show Us the Way. So let's sing this together. Say the Lord's Prayer together. God, we thank you that you show us the way. We thank you that you give us the Bible and you give us one another so that we can tell where you want to lead us. Hear us now as we share the prayer that Jesus taught us all to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Okay, so I think he's going to go out to Kids Church this way, and we'll see you all uh, later.
Good morning. The scripture reading this morning, and I'm reading from the Living Bible, is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. Listen to me, all of you in far off lands. The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called me by my name. God will make my words of judgment sharp as swords. He has hidden me in the shadow of his hand. I am like a sharp arrow in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, a prince of power with God, and you shall bring me glory. I replied, but my work for them seems all in vain. I have spent my strength for them without response. Yet I leave it all with God for my reward. And now, said the Lord, the Lord who formed me from my mother's womb, to serve him who commissioned me to restore him, his people Israel, who has given me the strength to perform this task and honored me for doing it. You shall do more than restore Israel to me. I will make you a light to the nations of the world to bring my salvation to them too. First reading from the New Testament is from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers that unless they adhered to the ancient Jewish custom of circumcision, they could not be saved. Paul and Barnabas argued and discussed this with them at length, and finally the believers sent them to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local men, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. After the entire congregation had escorted them out of the city, the delegates went on to Jerusalem, stopping along the way in the cities of Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers, telling them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. Arriving in Jerusalem, they met with the church leaders. All the apostles and elders were present, and Paul and Barnabas reported on what God had been doing through their ministry. Our last reading is from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. When Jesus had finished his sermon, he went back into the city of Capernaum. Just at that time, the highly prized slave of a Roman army captain was sick and near death. When the captain heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to him to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they began pleading earnestly with Jesus to come with them and help the man. They told him what a wonderful person the captain was. If anyone deserves your help, it is he, they said, for he loves the Jews and even paid personally to build us a synagogue. Jesus went with them, but just before arriving at the house, the captain sent some friends to say, Sir, don't inconvenience yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of any such honor or even to come and meet you. Just speak a word from where you are, and my servant boy will be healed. I know because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my men. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come, to my slave, do this or that, and he does it. So just say, be healed, and my servant will be well again. Jesus was amazed. Turning to the crowd, he said, never among all the Jews in Israel have I met a man with faith like this. And when the captain's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. God, we thank you that you speak to us in so many ways, uh, that you speak to us through scripture, uh, that you speak to us as a community. And we pray for the gift and the help of your Holy Spirit so that we can understand the word that you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the third in our series of uh, how we hear God. Um, we as Christians believe in a God who speaks, that God communicates with us through the word, but how do we hear that word? Uh, to review, two weeks ago, I said that for Christians, the Bible 
is the main medium through which God's word comes to us. The Bible grounds us in a truth that is far more trustworthy than our own personal thoughts or experiences. Last week, I suggested that Jesus is the lens or the window through which we interpret the Bible. Jesus is the standard by which we know that what we find in the Bible is actually what God wants us to find. And when we interpret the Bible, it has to be consistent with what we know of Jesus. But the thing is, we're not connected to Jesus as isolated individuals. We're only connected to Jesus as part of a community. And so that brings us to the third dimension of hearing God, which is the church. Jesus is risen, he's alive, uh, he's seated at the right hand of God, as it says in the creed. Jesus lives in heaven, if you will. But Jesus is also alive here on earth through his body, through us, through the church. You are the body of Christ, St. Paul wrote. Jesus is not here physically in the form of a single human being as he was when he walked the earth long ago, but Jesus is here through his church with its many different members. Now, if you think about it, that's a pretty bizarre claim. I mean, it's especially bizarre if you have experienced the reality of the church. Sometimes the church just doesn't seem an awful lot like the body of Christ. Sure, we love our church, but the church is not always successful in living up to its calling of being the body of Christ. People say, the reason I left the church is because I didn't hear the voice of God at all. All I heard was a lot of petty bickering and infighting. I didn't find Christ. All I found was a whole lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with me. Recently, I heard someone say that lots of people still believe in God, but they don't want to have anything to do with the church because of all the politics, all the politics. Now, I'm not sure that the politics in the church is any different than the politics in the office or the staff room at the high school or the minor hockey executive or the playground. But that comment is very typical of people's view of the church today, that it's full of pettiness and self-righteousness and is more of a barrier than a gateway to God. It's pretty nervy of us to say that the church that is, the church as it really is, not as we wish it would be, that the church is a trustworthy guide to hearing the voice of God. And yet, for some reason, known only to him and his Father, Jesus has chosen this chipped and broken, flawed and fallible clay vessel called the church to carry his presence in the world. It seems crazy, but it's true. We cannot connect, though, with Jesus privately, just on our own. We can only connect with Jesus in the company of others, in a community, in a church. You can have spiritual thoughts and spiritual experiences. You can learn many interesting things about Jesus, but if you want to connect with the concrete reality of Jesus the Lord, you're going to have to deal with the concrete reality of the church sooner or later. That's just the way it is. And since Jesus and the Bible are intimately connected, as we said last week, we can't really understand the Bible on our own either. We need the church. Now, I don't mean that in the Roman Catholic sense of the church being the, the magisterium, the teaching authority. I simply mean that we are meant to read and understand the Bible in the company of others. Together, we read, we wrestle, we listen, we question, we engage, we argue sometimes, we search. Together we discern what God is saying to us through that old, old book. Together we stumble along the road of discovering what it means to follow Christ, slipping, falling, sometimes losing our way, but always doing it together. There's nothing really mystical about this. We learn everything that we learn in the company of others. We grow through our interaction with others. We discern with the help of others. I made several stabs at trying to teach myself German when I was younger. I got a textbook. I did the exercises. I got cassette tapes. It was a long time ago from the library. 
but I made very little progress. It wasn't until I registered in a, a course at university uh, where I could interact with a teacher and other students that I actually started to get somewhere. And then I registered for a second level course. And then I traveled to Germany and I took an immersion course where you were surrounded by German speakers and you had to speak German all the time. And that's when I felt like I started to get a grip on that most difficult and frustrating language. Anyway, I came home and I joined a German reading group. Each week we'd get together and we would translate passages from books, more progress. And I got to the point where I could read German fairly well and I could carry on a passable conversation as long as my conversation partner didn't speak too fast. Well, that was 20 years ago. I finished my doctorate and I no longer had occasion to speak German very much and I didn't really need to read books in German anymore. And when my wife and I went to Germany in 2007 to visit our daughter, it was painfully obvious how much German I had forgotten. I could still formulate questions I wanted to, when I wanted to ask something, but when I, the answer came back in German, I was completely lost. Well, trying to read the Bible by yourself, uh, sitting by yourself in your room, is kind of like trying to learn German with a textbook and a dictionary and a CD. You can do it, you just can't do it very effectively. You pretty quickly run up against the limits of what you are able to accomplish on your own. You need others to help you. And that is one reason why we have a church. The Bible is not like, a good, not like a good, the good novel that you curl up with in front of the fire. The Bible is the community's book, it's a product of the community, and it is meant to be read within a community of interpretation. Even that good novel can come alive in new and unexpected ways when you join a book group and you get to hear the thoughts and the insights of others. How much truer is that of the church's book, the Bible? But did you know that the Bible actually reads itself? The Bible actually interprets itself. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Well, think of this. Many books of the Bible contain quotations from or references to other parts of the Bible. Just look at any book in the New Testament. You will find that it's full of quotations from the Hebrew Scriptures, or what we call the Old Testament. All the books in the Bible are products of communities. None of them is the work of a single inspired individual. Uh, even the letters of Paul that are, are written by one person are part of a community conversation. And the Bible is actually one big ongoing conversation where God's people are continually rethinking and reinterpreting the stories, teachings, and traditions that have been passed down to them. Our three readings today that Nola read for us are an illustration of this. I want to show them to you as kind of a case study, if you will, of what I'm talking about. They show the community of faith over time reflecting, wrestling, and engaging with Scripture in order to come to a fuller understanding of who God is and what God desires. We'll start with our first reading from the 49th chapter of Isaiah. This text comes from a time approximately 550 years before Christ, when much of the Jewish community was in exile in Babylon. Babylon is in present-day Iraq. And they had been taken there as captives after the Babylonian army had conquered their country and destroyed their capital city, Jerusalem. This was not only a national disaster, as you can well imagine, but it triggered an enormous crisis of faith. For centuries, the Jews had believed that they were God's chosen people. Jerusalem was God's chosen city, and the temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem was God's own house. They also believed that their God was not just one more tribal deity, but the Lord of heaven and earth. Their God ruled over all the nations, not just theirs. And for these reasons, they believed that no matter how bad things got, God would never, ever allow Jerusalem to be conquered. But then the unthinkable happened. 
Jerusalem was conquered, and the temple was reduced to a, a heap of smoldering ruins. Just imagine for a minute, if you can, that you were there. Imagine your entire worldview was built on your belief in the unassailability of Jerusalem, and then suddenly it was all swept away, gone, smashed, destroyed. What kind of questions would you be asking? Well, you'd be asking, where is God? What went, were, were we foolish to put our trust in God? Is God not strong enough to keep his promises, to protect us? Has God abandoned us? It must have been a time of not only national humiliation, but spiritual devastation. Imagine you were among those exiles, far from home, strangers in a strange land. What will you be discussing when you get together with family and friends around the fire at night? What questions you will, be ask, will you be asking? We thought we were God's chosen people, but what does that mean if all of this can happen to us? How can we be Jews when we are separated from the land, the land of promise, the sign of God's faithfulness to us? The God we thought we knew is turning out to be a stranger. Well, this was a community conversation, wrestling, pondering, praying, discussing. And gradually out of that conversation, a new understanding began to emerge. It turns out that God does not always act in the way we, we expect. God is not just a victorious warrior who smashes his enemies by force. Sometimes God's triumphs look like defeats. Sometimes God's strength comes to us disguised in what looks like weakness. Sometimes God's people have to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Sometimes we are called to live out our faith in a land of exile. Maybe we're in exile then because that's where God wants us to be. Maybe God has put us in this strange land for a purpose. Maybe we're being given a mission, a mission to teach other nations who this God is. And during this time, memories of the ancient story of Abraham came to the fore. They remembered that long ago God called Abraham to leave the security of his home and his city and set out on a journey to an unknown destination. And they remembered how God blessed Abraham, not just for his own benefit, but so that he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. On the surface of things, things look hopeless. I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing, they lamented. But maybe God was preparing them to fulfill the promise to Abraham, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Well, fast forward 500 years or so, Jesus has come as the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, the King of the Jews. Jesus is fulfilling promises that were spoken long ago by the prophets. But Jesus is not the Messiah that people expected either. He's full of surprises. For one thing, he largely ignores the religious law-abiding people, you know, the pastors and elders of the church, and he spends his time with the poor, the outcast, and the sinners. What's that all about? And Jesus, it seems, doesn't care much for the barriers that separated Jews from Gentiles. His healing power breaks down the walls of religious propriety. A Roman soldier, not just a Gentile, but a member of the occupying army, comes and asks Jesus to heal his favorite slave. And his level of trust is so remarkable that he tells Jesus, you know, you don't even need to come in person. You just say the word, and I know that he'll be healed. And uh, Jesus exclaims, wow, wow. I have not found such faith even in Israel. Luke doesn't quote Isaiah here, but you can bet your boots he's remembering the text from Isaiah, I will give you as a light to the nations. And he's telling us that Jesus is making that promise a living reality. 
Jesus shines God's light into the world, and that light is destined to fall on Gentiles and Jews alike. Israel's mission to carry God's salvation beyond their own walls is being embodied right then and there by Jesus. The biblical promise, Luke is telling us, is coming true in Jesus. Well, then we move ahead a little bit farther in time to the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church. Written by the same author as Luke, it's about what happens after Jesus rose on Easter morning. His followers were filled with the power of his resurrection, and they started to spread the good news beyond Jerusalem in ever-widening circles. And as they moved farther and farther from their home base, they came more and more into contact with Gentiles or non-Jews. And to everyone's surprise, the Gentiles started to come to faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, as well. They accepted him and his message. Their lives were transformed by his spirit, even though they were not part of the covenant people. Some said, well, that's great, that's all well and good, but they have to start obeying the commandments of Moses. The men have to be circumcised, they have to eat kosher food, uh, they have to keep all the rules about cleanliness and sacrifices and the Sabbath. Sure, they can be Christians, but they have to become Jews first. But then there was this biblical memory, this memory of Isaiah saying, I will make you a light to the Gentiles, to the nations. And there were memories of Jesus who made that prophecy a reality. And then there were all of these reports about the Holy Spirit moving powerfully in people's lives, even though they were outsiders. And so the church decided to get together to talk about it, decide what to do. They decided to have a meeting. That's what we do in church. They got together to listen and to deliberate, to pray, to discern. And they decided that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If the power of Christ is evident in their lives, what would be the point of uh, burdening these Gentiles with all of our religious customs? I'm sure they knew and remembered Isaiah's words that God's ultimate goal was that my salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. And so the door was opened and Christianity was transformed from a small Jewish sect to a worldwide movement. It's hard for us to appreciate what a revolutionary change this must have been. Imagine you had grown up your entire life being taught that you had to stay away from Gentiles because they were religiously unclean. Imagine your whole self-image being based on the idea of keeping separate and remaining pure. And now you're supposed to open your heart, your home, your church, to people you would never have associated with before. Acts paints a rosy picture of the unity of the church. They come together for this nice discussion. They listen politely to Paul and Barnabas and Peter, and they quickly agree that, of course, the Gentiles will be allowed in. We know from other sources, however, that this was a bitterly fought battle in the early Christian church. And here's the interesting thing, I think. Those on the other side of the question probably had the stronger scriptural case, or at least they thought they did. Those on the other side of the question could quote scripture verse after scripture verse to prove that God wanted Israel to remain pure and separate from the other nations. And surely when the Messiah came, that purity and, and uh, separateness would be strengthened, not done away with. Such a radical change could only be a community achievement. It could only happen when the community gathered in Jesus' name, and when they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, when together they wrestled with Scripture and their knowledge of Jesus, and then opened themselves to a new reality. They completely changed their direction, and then they went out and changed the world. I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel like we've lost our way. We're caught up in massive changes that are happening all around us. We don't know what to do. We don't know which way to go. We don't know if the choices we're making are the ones that God wants us to make. But one thing is for sure. We will not sort those things out on our own. We can only do it together 
not just together with one another, but together in the bigger sense of being in touch with God's church throughout the world. We can only do it with God's help. Discerning God's will does not usually happen in a flash of insight in the world of my own private thoughts. It can only happen as part of a community of people who are on a common journey. And I think that one of our problems today is that we simply don't spend enough time engaging with Scripture together. You know, I study Scripture. Of course I do. I get paid to do it. A few faithful people come to Bible studies when they're offered. And there are typical reasons. You know, I don't have time. It's not convenient. I find it confusing. I, I don't really find it interesting. But we won't get any clarity about where Jesus wants to lead us until we figure out, way, figure out ways of devoting ourselves to Scripture, to getting Scripture into the water system of our church, so to speak. Now, there's good news. First, once you start, it becomes pure joy. The book of Psalms says that God's words are nourishing bread, and they're sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. Second, there's more help available today than there has ever been for folks who want to get in touch with Scripture, for people who want to engage with Scripture. Books and online, there's just, the resources are endless. So whatever is getting in the way, it isn't a problem that's out there, it's a problem that's in here or in here. God speaks to us through the Bible. Jesus is the lens through which as Christians we interpret the Bible. But we can only do that together as a church in the company of others. I'd like to give you a question to reflect on for just a minute. Think of one thing that would help you to read and understand the Bible better. Think of one thing that the church could give you or that you could acquire that would help you understand the Bible better. So I want you to think about that and feel free to talk to the person that you're sitting beside uh, about that. You've just been given permission to speak in church, so go ahead. That's planted a seed in your mind, and you've begun a conversation with someone else. Uh, this is not the best forum to, to do so, but I really, if, if you've thought of something, I'd really appreciate it if you would share that. You can share that verbally, you can share that in writing. Uh, just what do we need to do for each other so that we can make this uh, journey of engagement with Scripture uh, richer and more rewarding uh, and more effective for all of us? So. I really in, invite feedback about that, either email, a uh, note, uh, a conversation, and uh, well, let's keep that conversation going. Amen. Our next hymn is um, a little less familiar, uh, not one we sing a lot, um, but uh, great words, um, number 601 in Voices United the Church of Christ in every age.
seated. When we gather uh, as a church, it's not just our own spirit of cooperation that brings us together, it's Christ. And it's only Christ who can overcome the divisions that naturally separate us and make us one. We're going to begin our prayer time today by singing a simple chorus that is uh, also a prayer. Uh, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. So let's sing this together as a way of leading ourselves into prayer. God, we pray that you would heal the wounds in your body. Scripture says we are one in Christ, and yet nothing has set people against one another more than their claims to follow Christ. We pray that whatever differences we have, they may be removed by our common faith in the one who came to save us all. We confess all the ways, too numerous to count, that we have failed to be your body. We have not heard the cry of the poor, we have not bound up the wounds of the hurting. We have not comforted the grief-stricken, fed the hungry, or visited those in prison, whether prisons with visible bars or prisons with bars that no one can see. We have fought over trivial things, and we have neglected the things of importance. Forgive us, we pray. God, we pray that we may always seek your will together as a community trusting one another to hear a word from you, helping one another understand. Deliver the, us from that pride of thinking that only we know the answers. Bind us together as a band of fellow pilgrims on the road of faith. God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May we shine that word into one another's lives so that we may discover truth and hope and peace and may we always have the courage to put our lives under the harsh and searching light of your word. May we offer that word to others through what we say and what we do. God, bless those who are in need. Each of us is hurting because we love someone who is hurting, and their burdens are our burdens. Hear us as we name them before you, those in need of prayer. Someone has asked prayer for Rosemary as she struggles with health problems. Someone has requested prayer for the families of those killed and injured in the Ottawa bus accident. 
Someone has asked that we remember in prayer the church in Pakistan that was attacked by a suicide bomber. Someone has asked prayer for their brother and sister who are uh, ill and for a brother-in-law with cancer. Someone has asked prayer for Kathy who is in poor health. And prayer has been requested for Colleen. God, give us simple childlike trust that you are willing to hear us when we call upon you. Help us to pray without ceasing, to pray until our whole lives become an act of prayer. We know we can pray confidently because we pray through the one who teaches us to pray and who lives and prays for us our faithful Savior, Jesus. Amen. In the book of James, it says this, Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So not only the things that we give, but our willingness to give them comes from God. Let's give expression to our faith by sharing our morning offering. Gracious God, you call us to let go of the things we cling to and to step out in faith, trusting in your love and provision. Give us courage to step out boldly, to plant our small seeds generously and without fear. Use our gifts to accomplish more than we could possibly imagine, so that 
in partnership with us, your kingdom might come and your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn this morning is number 331, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord, number 331. as a church, now is the time to scatter. Our worship service is over, but we don't stop being the church. We're now set out to follow Christ in the places where God takes us. So go from here, ready to love God and your neighbor in all that you say and all that you do. And may the blessing of the triune God who has created us, who has redeemed us, and who sustains us always be with you. Go in God's peace. <laughs>